most um, designers, I would say that they kind of focus on the mechanics and the pivot placement, stop pin, lock face, uh, lock relief, all that, like measurements and stuff before they actually go in and do the uh, the profiles. I actually do that last. I uh, Everything starts out as pretty much a fixed blade with a pivot. That way, after I have that profile, I can then put in the mechanics of it. So I kind of go on the opposite. I kind of work backwards a bit. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome. Hey, Bob, here we are again on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And guess what we're going to do? What's that? We're going to talk knives. Let's do it. Let's talk knives. And who are you going to talk knives to? Well, today's guest is Elijah Isham, and uh, if you want to talk knives, if you want to talk unusual knives, if you want to talk avant-garde knives, let's Ooh. talk Elijah Isham. A lot of words there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying he makes some pretty fancy knife designs. Right. And uh, he's he's uh, kind of come onto the scene like a storm in the past couple of years and uh, has really created some designs that, frankly, look kind of impossible. Uh, but they are functioning, ergonomically sound, working tools. So uh, I can't wait to talk to Elijah and and find out uh, where these things come from. Well, and also I had a chance to uh, talk to Bill Goodman of Good Knives LLC. He's the uh, show promoter for the Lehigh Valley Knife Show. That uh, show is coming up uh, early part of May, and uh, that interview will also be coming up to give our listeners a chance to uh, learn about that show in Lehigh Valley uh, and uh, maybe... Uh, get their plans made to, to go attend that. But I uh, want to first tell you that uh, this Knife Junkie podcast is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed. It's your year-round tax solution. It's a must-have if you're a contractor, a freelancer. If you're self-employed and doing any kind of business, you'll want to go to theknifejunkie.com slash QB30. That's QB30. Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free. Just go to theknifejunkie.com slash QB30. You know you're a knife junkie if you love your knives more than your spouse. My guest today is a knife designer without peer. His enigmatic blade-centric sculptures have been the engineering pride of some of the top manufacturers in the industry, and his style has helped define the aesthetics of the current era of knife design. Elijah Isham's greatest hits include the Eschaton and Pleroma for Wii, the Megatherium and Theta for Kaiser, and the recent innovative Black Star, released under his own label, Isham Bladeworks. Elijah, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me. Just in looking at uh, all of your work, uh, you seem to have uh, been pretty prolific just in the past few years. Uh, there seems to be quite an emphasis on art in your work very unusual designs that also are functional. So where did you come from? Uh, have you always been a designer and a knife guy? Uh, yeah, I've been a knife guy since I was really little, about six years old. Didn't really start getting into uh, design work, though, until I started designing knives, which was in about 2012. Yeah, And um, yeah, for the most part, it's always been kind of art focused. I love paintings and sculptures. At first, it wasn't. It was bushcraft focused. But then as I got more into uh, folders, I figured, well, there's not a whole lot of uh, bushcraft stuff in the folder market. So I might as well switch over to my other interests, which were art and uh, sculpture. That's actually uh, comes as quite a surprise to me just to hear that your interest started in bushcraft knives because just in, in thinking about their design, they're so um, sort of straightforward. And that's not how I would describe your designs. Yeah, that was one of the things that I didn't want to... Uh, continue on with because those are built for like pure function and they're built to solely cut wood and usually you only need like a broomstick handle and a straight drop point or like a kept heart style blade and you're pretty much doing the same thing over and over which is fine in its own right but uh it can get a little boring if you if you're wanting to uh you know put your flourishes on some stuff and your perspective on design it can kind of get muddled so you kind of have to branch out and just use different lines and shapes and folders is has let me do that. You, you talk about your perspective on design, and that's kind of an interesting, uh, well, it's a, it's a real difference from uh, having a perspective on the function of a knife that's meant solely to cut wood. Mm -hmm. 
what inspires your designs? I mean, I think of uh, I think of graffiti. I think of hair on manga figures. I think of Italian futurism when I look at your designs. Mm-hmm. What um, what does your design process look like, and where do you get these inspirations? Especially coming from the background of uh, bushcraft, initially they're so unusual. Mm-hmm. Where do you get your inspiration? Definitely from like biomechanical influence art and some futurists like Sid Mead and uh, pretty much anything with like sinuous lines in it, uh, like a flowing organic kind of structure has always intrigued me. So I usually try to throw my take on that into a lot of my knife like handles and, and such. But I used to like with the Eschaton and the Arrakis, especially that kind of has flowed into the blade and uh, to kind of round it out. So yeah, those are those are definitely more art influenced. Mm-hmm. But uh, I definitely try and uh, focus on like ergonomics and function just as much as the uh, artistic aspects of them. Yeah, pretty much equally as best I can. Well, what does your design process look like? Is it all CAD or do you uh, work stuff out on paper? How does that work? Uh, for right now, from like I think about 2013, mid 2013, 2014, uh, it's all done in CAD. Like I don't even do any sketches anymore because I was doing sketches for a while with uh, pencil and paper. but it would change so much that uh, I kind of got frustrated because the sketch would either be almost near impossible to replicate in CAD to, to function as a, a functioning folder. So it would kind of just be stuck in like a, a fixed blade uh, profile. So I just did everything in CAD from then on because it was just easier. Everything kind of flowed together better and I could erase and it was a much faster process too. Is it easier for you to conceptualize the mechanics of a folder in CAD? Oh, yeah, for sure. Most um, designers, I would say that they kind of focus on the mechanics and the pivot placement, stop pin, lock face, uh, lock relief, all that, like measurements and stuff before they actually go in and do the uh, the profiles. I actually do that last. I uh, Everything starts out as pretty much a fixed blade with a pivot. That way, after I have that profile, I can then put in the mechanics of it. So I kind of go on the opposite. I kind of work backwards a bit. So uh, working backwards a bit, meaning uh, you sort of uh, work on the aesthetics and then get the function out of it. Yeah, not so much like necessarily just the aesthetics, but mm-hmm. it's kind of basically a um, a slip joint, I guess you could say. It just folds. So after that, you can go in and think about where your, uh, your stop pin location is going to be, mm-hmm. your lock face, whether it's going to be in the blade or in the handle. And anymore, a lot of my stop pins you'll you'll notice are in the blade, and the track is actually in the handle because when you do that, it allows for much more freedom around the pivot for like different geometry and stuff. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, the uh, if the stop pin was in the handle, then the track would be in the blade, and it would cut into it would. There's so much there's there's so little space around the pivot that everything can get really tight. So you gotta you gotta make room for everything. And if it were in the handle, then it would uh just interfere with the lock face. So it's got to be in the blade on a lot of my uh, more recent designs. So what kind of uh, fabricating capabilities do you have in your shop? I'm not sure uh, if you're, um, if you make knives in your shop, do you 3d print them? Is the uh, proving happening in the virtual world with uh, 3d CAD? Well, I'm, I don't really have a shop per se. I, uh, I do have a, a couple of machines, some old stuff. I, I do have a bridge port, which I have yet to use. But um, for right now, it's just done uh, 3D printing and um, just physical paper cutouts mm-hmm. to check ergonomics and everything. But um, after you've done it for so long, you kind of know by the measurements of stuff, whether it's going to work or not. So as far as the shop, that's like something in the future that I'm thinking about, like actually making some knives, some customs uh, later down the road. So um, collaborating, how important is it in what you do right now? You have collaborated with uh, some of the top manufacturers mm-hmm. who have been able to realize your very uh, complicated and unusual designs. And you've also worked with other knife makers uh, like uh, Jeff Blauvelt, for instance, with the uh, the drool-worthy Black Knight satellite knife. I love that mm-hmm. knife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how do you approach the collaborating process differently when you're working with a Wii knives uh, as opposed to uh, Jeff Blauvelt? For Wii especially, they can um, their manufacturing process with the CNC and their uh, wire EDM is just far more advanced than anything a uh, a custom maker could do in a, in a shop, just a one man shop. So uh, the limits are kind of not there. Like it's kind of a uh, a boundless opportunity to kind of design whatever I want and then hand it off and then see if it's 
you know, producible. And luckily enough, with uh, Wee Knives, it was <laughs> with the uh, Eskiton and uh, some of the more crazy ones. I mean, they, they must look at the uh, – when you hand them a design like that, they must take that as a, uh, a challenge they can't pass up because if they pull it off, they get to brag that they pulled it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little bit. And then that will only uh, inspire more crazy designs. And I don't mean to call your work crazy, but, uh, you know, it is it is quite unusual. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, I would agree with that. It is a bit crazy. Uh, what gives you the the nerve? What what gives you the right to design such knives? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I I think it's really cool. Uh, I mean, because yeah. they're they're extremely unusual, but they all have um, they all touch the the real world, if you will. And I'm thinking right now about the the Polaroma, which um, mm-hmm. I have yet to hold myself, but I'm a great big fan of Swaybacks, and to me, this is evocative of a Swayback. And I'm, of course, I'm not the first person to say that, but. To me, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like that might be the most usable of your knives. How would you qualify that statement? And what design of yours do you think is the most crossover? The Pleroma is definitely up there because it, it's definitely a crossover design, like you said. Uh, it came from the the last set of five in the Simple Series that I did. But I took those kind of further and I wanted to like put a little bit of the... Um, the Odyssey series, like of what the uh, Eschaton and the Arrakis are, I wanted to kind of like put a little bit of that flavor in there too. So um, that's why the construct, the crazy construction and the um, the floating spine, the vertebral integral construction. But it was just a plain swayback design to begin with, and then I just kind of kept going with it until I felt it, you know, it was done. But yeah, that one pretty much in the hand, and when you're using it, it's just a normal uh, swayback design. It's actually really like really functional. Yeah. And and that blade, uh, not only is it just so in one stroke, very obvious, but also very imaginative with the, with the floating thumb Mm -hmm. stud. I mean, like that is such a cool touch, but the blade itself also seems like it, you could just get a ton of mileage out of it. Oh yeah. They, um, they got the grind down to, I think like 15 thousands behind the edge, 10 to 15. And it is like super slicey. But like on the uh, on the floating thumb stud, the reason that I did that is because it's a swayback pattern. And if you know, I usually like to hide my flipper tabs completely in the handle. Uh-huh. And um, I couldn't do it on this model because it would there was no way of doing it with a geometry because it just wouldn't allow for one. It, it would be sticking out and just kind of ruin the flow. <laughs> so I, I thought about the, the blade cutout was already there. So I thought about uh, adding a thumb stud. And that was kind of the only spot that it made sense. And I didn't want to get rid of the cutout either, so I just kind of shaped it around to perform that little island of steel that the uh, the thumb stud kind of rests on. And it just kind of worked out. And I actually do have another model with a Wii coming out. Probably You'll probably see it in uh, for Blade Show West. It has the same construction, and it, it also has a uh, the floating thumb stud as well, but it's a um, it's more like a Persian design. It's like a Ooh. stubby Persian type of thing. Yeah, Stubby meaning small? It's kind of small. It's like the same, about the same size as the Pleroma, but it's, the blade is kind of wide and it's, yeah, it's just got a, like an aggressive sweep to it. It's really, it's interesting. The uh, Black Star that came out in 2018, if I'm, if mm-hmm. I'm correct. Uh, that knife came out to a lot of fanfare because it's beautiful and also because it's non-locking. But I think it's uh, it's where where your other designs are very innovative aesthetically. There's things we've never seen before. This knife, the Black Star, is very innovative uh, mechanically. It it is a non-locking knife, but it's not like one we've ever seen before. And it's a flipper. How did you come up with that? What was the uh, what was the impetus for that that creation? Well, um, Justin Lundquist, are you familiar with his work? Yes. I've been friends with him for quite a while and I've been talking with him about doing uh, a slip joint design and I finally did like three of them, but two of those are kind of still in the works. But um, we had talked about doing one for a long time and how we both liked uh, Jared Osier's work, his Mm -hmm. modern slip joints. And it seems kind of like right now it's kind of cooling off a bit, but I don't know. I mean, you can never really tell. You can never really predict where it's going. You you mean the uh, the slip joint phase, right? Recently? Yeah, the slip joint craze. Yeah, like yeah. last year, it seemed like to hit its peak. But um, I really wanted to design a um a new take with like a new, somewhat kind of new mechanism and a uh, a modern slip joint. And so I did the the flipper. But uh, Serge Panchenko had done that, but in his own way, and I kind of had to 
do my own take on it. So, uh, and that resulted in the uh, the Black Star because I wanted a clip point, like a Bowie. That clip point, uh, by the way, I would love to have that in a big fixed blade. That the profile of that blade is just killer, and I think it would make a, a really sweet belt knife. But that aside, you wanted this to be a flipper. So why why the um, so was it about the non locking aspect of it? Is that why you mm-hmm. set out to design it in the first place? Yeah, uh, it was kind of spur of the moment. I wanted it to be a traditional slip joint, but with the flipper tab, that was going to be an impossibility with the uh, the spring bar. So I had to um, just do the the detent driven spring bar inside the frame, um, and that seemed to work pretty good. On the next run of the Black Star, there's actually going to be two spring bars, so it's a little stiffer. Uh, that's one problem that a lot of people had, that it was a little too easy to close in the open position, so it's going to have two spring bars. But uh, yeah, I don't know, something intrigued me about that that whole system of like a small knife, but with a clip. Right. Perfect for the watch pocket carry. Oh, yeah. So this knife came out under under your uh, Isham Bladeworks shingle. Uh, is that mm-hmm. the first knife uh, to come out under your own brand? Yes, it is the very first knife. Um, there'll be others, but uh, that was the first one. Uh, we released it. It took about a year to get to market, and then we released it in about October, November of last year. I saw, I was looking, poking around online and saw uh, an artist statement that you made on yep. Wii, and you mentioned sacred geometry, and uh-huh. then you try to uh, integrate as much sacred geometry into your designs as possible. What does that mean? I kind of have an inkling, but I'm not really sure. Well, it's like, um, it's kind of hard to explain a little bit. It it has to like deal with the way line flow, like relates to itself like proportion in uh, relation to ratio like the fibonacci sequence it's like the following number after itself it's like one one three five like it's a way to design it's kind of in everything already inherently in nature but when you implement it in design it kind of just seems correct to the eye is this the uh, spiraling out visual um, geometry image uh, that you see? Um, I think I know what you're kind of getting to a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so with the sacred geometry, uh, you find that when you um, use this uh, ideal in your design process, it brings out, what, a more interesting knife, a more balanced knife? It seems to, yeah. Um, especially on the, like the one design that I've used it in the most is the Pleroma with all the curve and all that. It kind of, it's not really necessarily about line. It's more about curve, if that makes sense. I so, think it So kind of like an angular design, a really angular, like linear kind of quay back or something. Uh, doesn't have a lot of it, but it's its own thing too. To put it simply, I like curvature more than like straight angular lines. But some people think my work is pretty angular, so I don't know. Well, of your own designs and in your own work, what do you find the most artistically mature? I would say probably the Pleroma or some of the new designs I have coming out. It's kind of distilling down into this, uh, like not as insane uh, geometry kind of, it's like subtle, but not so much, but yeah, it's not like in your face as the Eschaton is. Like the, uh, the new Civivis you might be referring to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those those have uh those seem to have all of your signature, well, curves is what you you're talking about. Seem to have all of all of your lines without much extra. Is that what you're getting at? Distilled down to, mm-hmm. to yeah, its like essence. Just about as much as is is needed. Like nothing more than that nothing that ne- doesn't need to be there. Um like the Pleroma I think is one of my best designs. And there's some more that are coming that uh, haven't been shown yet that I, I feel really good about. So from your perspective, who is your customer? Who is buying your knives? I think like strictly just fans of mine, uh, people who want to want a cutting implement, but also want to carry something that's a little, a little different and a little uh, intriguing to the eye and kind of like, like a jewelry piece, but you know, in a knife, but it's not a custom. So it's more attainable. Because, I mean, you can just buy any knife, but I try to make every one of these unique as possible and uh, kind of differentiate them from the next. And, um, yeah, just something of interest, like a little kind of niche like market. So where do you see uh, your designs and your output? How do you see Aisham Bladeworks, for instance, evolving in the future? Well, the the goal from the beginning was to definitely start making customs. And now it seems like, I do want to have a small, like a small uh, run production company and also do customs uh, moving forward, but that's going to take a lot of, 
a lot of time, a lot of learning, knife making. But that's the goal for the future is to uh, kind of branch into a, a custom market for sure and start doing, eventually start doing, doing uh, strictly art knives, uh, like one at a time, all handmade, no CNC, nothing like that. Uh, a lot of carving and intricate detail work. But uh, yeah, that's a that's, uh, ways down the road yet. Do you see yourself designing other products? Are you a product designer first and foremost? Or are you a knife designer first and foremost? I would say I'm definitely a knife designer. I've never, never really thought about product design, but I have recently thought about, yeah, possibly making other stuff, other little uh, gadgets or I don't know, like everyday carry items, and maybe even branching uh, further into some other uh, realm of design. But yeah, I hadn't thought about it uh, in the past, but I am uh, starting to think about that more and more. So, what do you want? What do you want your legacy uh, in the knife world to be? You've you've uh, kind of captivated and challenged the knife world in the in the few short years you've been on the scene. What what do you want to be remembered for? The unique kind of I don't know, just the uniqueness that I kind of brought to it to give people an idea of what else is possible. To not be so uh, not have the blinders on so much and just kind of think kind of like explore into what other territory of just as something as simple as a knife could could do like what could um what could be made from the same thing that had been made forever but uh like offer something brand new kind of to it like from just a completely different perspective yeah that's something we talk about a lot here uh that the knife is the the very first tool and uh and you can view it mm-hmm. strictly as a tool or you can you can take it all the way to art knife, as you mentioned, with everything hand carved with expensive materials and, yeah. and uh, uh-huh. you know. So uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and to find your work, to buy your work, to, to keep up with your designs? Uh, definitely on my Instagram uh, at Aish and Blade Works. That's uh, my main outlet for everything. I usually post a lot of teasers on there. What's new? Uh, trying to keep up with the story uh, pretty regularly every day. When you start getting your hands dirty and uh, with mm-hmm. the actual making of knives, do you have mentors in mind, people you want to show you the ropes? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, John Gray, uh, if you're familiar with him, he has offered me to uh, apprentice me for a, for a period of time. and definitely going to take him up on that offer, go out and visit him and learn as much as I can. Nick Chuprin, he's probably going to teach me quite a, quite a bit, even on the uh, CNC side of that. Hmm. And probably Jeff Blavelt, uh good friends with him, probably go out to his shop and learn some stuff. Yeah, you keep you keep some fine company, sir. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so a knife guy since age six, you must have a knife story. Some t- some day a knife saved the day, or something funny that happened, or maybe something that happened uh, on the way of taking your design to Wee Knives. You got any uh, uh, any knife stories? Uh, there's a couple. Uh, one of the earliest ones was uh, the, one of the first knives I ever got. I'd had it for for a long time. I still have it, but um, I'd had it for a long time up until the point that uh, I cut my thumb open. It was probably the worst worst cut I've ever had in my life. Was just from a small little Swiss Army knife. <laughs> I guess recently, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, I was with uh, Nick Chuprin and Jeremiah Burbank of PVK Knives or uh. PVK Vegas, and we were in uh, Portland. We were going to a club and. We thought, oh, they're probably going to have metal detectors or something. You know, we probably can't bring knives in here. Um, So we didn't take any knives with us. We we were completely knifeless. And we show up, and uh, of course they didn't. And later on, (laughs) we were were outside, and we were talking to these guys or something, and somebody started talking about knives. And (laughs) and lo and behold, uh, I think three or four, they all had knives on them, and we had nothing. So uh, we were kind of taken aback a little bit because yeah these guys had spider coats and, uh, <laughs> and we, we were stuck there with nothing and we we're the knife guys yeah yeah and you could have produced like the sweetest things you know in yeah. town yeah instead we got shown uh <laughs> shown up by these guys that yeah they they were carrying <laughs> some pretty cool stuff and we had nothing to show so that's funny man do you carry your own knives or your own designs i do i carry a lot of um other people's designs most of the time other people's knives i, I carry a sabenza a lot it's a great knife mm-hmm but yeah, I carry, uh, like every time I get a new prototype in, I always carry it for weeks on end to just check it out and see how it rides in the pocket and see how it works. Uh, just a little testing. But um, yeah, I usually carry quite a few of my knives, generally. I carry the Black Star pretty much every day. So it, did you ever end up with a Black Star, uh, Black Knight satellite? Uh, not yet. We're going to, we're figuring out like what we're going to do with that design moving forward. But uh, we only made, uh, Jeff did, I think, five of those. 
and they're all one off. <laughs> yeah, and we just auctioned the the last one, nice. and it was the most the most crazy. He put like the most time he'd ever put in any knife on that one, and uh, it came out pretty great. Jeez, five out there in the wild, and none yep. of them are in my possession. That is a it's a terrible thing. Hopefully, I get to rectify that someday. Elijah Isham, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and and talking knives with us. It's been a real honor and pleasure to speak with you, sir. Yes, yeah, been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. And we're back on the Knife Junkie podcast talking to Bill Goodman, Good Knives, LLC, Uh, promoter of the Lehigh Valley Knife Show. They've got uh, two shows in 2019 coming up in September, but the one we're going to talk about today is the show May 4th and May 5th in Easton, Pennsylvania. And Bill, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely glad to have you. Always a pleasure to talk with knife guys and to promote knife shows. So tell us a little bit about the uh, May 4 and 5 event that you've got going on in Easton. Okay, well, it's been a growing show. I've been involved with knife shows since the 80s and uh, as a member of clubs that ran them. But a few years ago, the one club that ran the local shows went out of business, or the club's in business, but they gave up shows. So I said I'd I'd run them. And uh, we have two shows, one in the spring and one in the fall, the May 4th and 5th, and then September 28th and 29th this year. Normally, the May show would have been in April, but it turned out that was the same weekend as Easter. I didn't think that was a good idea. No, probably not. So we're having it May 4th, but next year we'll revert back to April. And it's held at a community center in Easton, Pennsylvania, called the Charles Shrin Community Center, also known as the Palmer Community Center. And it's uh, right along US-22, which is a major four-lane expressway going through Easton, and there are many other highways nearby. Mm -hmm. Typically, uh, as all knife shows, we buy, sell, trade, and display knives. We have new, antique, shiny, rusty, Factory, custom, hunting, military, trappers, carving, cooking, gardening, kitchen, bushcrafts, swords, bayonets, daggers, folders, Damascus, stainless steel, carbon steel, alloy steel, forged, pocket knives, buoys, tomahawks, razors, sharpeners, sheaths, and books. We have blacksmiths and crafters uh, welcome. In fact, blacksmiths set up on the lawn outside the building, and uh, they can do forging right there. And the more blacksmiths or knife smiths we get, the better. Yeah. And they demonstrate forging and knife making. We've also had uh, knife throwing contests. In fact, the fellow who had been, uh, I think he may still be the national champion knife thrower, set it up outside. Uh, unfortunately, he can't make the show now because his job has changed. He can't be available. But anyway, it's a very popular. It's a nice uh, park with lots of lawns around, so we can do a lot of things outside. The hosts, the community center, are very nice people, very hospitable, very uh, welcoming to the knife industry. And it's uh, Saturday and Sunday, May 4, May 5. I think Saturday hours, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Sunday, 9 to 3. Is there a cost for the event? Yes, it's $7 admission. And if you have supervised children, they're welcome also. No charge if under 13. And I'm sure good food is available as well? Yes, we have meals and snacks for sale in the community center. We have a caterer who comes in, plus there are many hotels and restaurants nearby. Where can uh, folks get more information? Website, telephone number, and is there any kind of deadline uh, to get a vendor table? Well, uh, ask you, answer your last question. Uh, we certainly hope that they will register for the tables early because it does fill up. But it's a big hall, and we do have people always at the last minute who want a table, and we just rearrange things. But we can do that. It's always best that they register early. Okay. And the we have uh, several things going. We have a website, which is www.pa, like Pennsylvania, knifeshow.com. I'll repeat, pa knifeshow.com. You go there, and on the website, there's a uh, pop-up which shows the application. And you can also read about the show and its past and the the many knife makers and vendors we've had there over the years and the ones who have registered already for this year. Uh, But also, you can go to Facebook. Under Facebook, look up Lehigh Valley Knife Show. Again, that's Lehigh Valley Knife Show. Lehigh is L-E-H-I-G-H, Valley Knife Show. And Facebook has a a nice page there for us where we have hundreds and hundreds of photos of uh, past uh, knife shows uh, with a lot of the uh, vendors 
holding their favorite knives and some of the customers. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook is not knife friendly. They have a policy against guns and knives. So they frequently lock me down or put me in so-called Facebook jail. Right. So whenever I'm promoting the knife show, but it is there and uh, please log into it. Also, yeah. when you go to the website, we hope you will register your name and email address, not because we're going to sell it. We don't, but it's there for us for reference. And then we can keep you up to date and keep and send you announcements of shows and other activities. So that's PAKnifeshow.com. Go there, get more information. Last 30 seconds or so, Bill, kind of tell us anything I haven't asked or anything you want us to know about the Lehigh Valley Knife Show and why folks should be there May 4 and May 5. Well, I believe it's one of the biggest knife shows in the country and the world. And a lot of makers were close to New York City and Philadelphia. So we draw heavily from a major metropolitan areas. We have like 30 million people living within 150 miles. So it's usually a big crowd. Yeah. And it's always a good time. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks, uh, Bill. Bill Goodman of Good Knives LLC talking about the May 4 and May 5 Lehigh Valley Knife Show. And we'll look to have you back on again maybe in August to, uh, to talk about the September event. And if our listeners want to find out more of these uh, knife shows around the country, just go to thenifejunkie.com and search our calendar of events, and you can find other knife shows there. Bill, thanks again. Thank you. There is a phone number they can call, too. Okay. It's a 484-241-6176. 484-241-6176. All right, Bill. Thanks so much for being on the podcast with us. Thank you, Jim. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. All right. And that, unfortunately, is going to wrap up this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. But uh, two great interviews uh, this week and some good information. Bob, a favorite part or final word? Just kind of throw it over to you to kind of wrap it up for us. Uh, well, one thing that uh, I really took from my conversation with Elijah Isham is that uh, despite the fact that just from looking at his knives, they're so unusual. And so uh, I keep using the term avant-garde looking, you know, they look like nothing you've ever seen before. And yet they still are, are functioning uh, knives and so much thought goes into the ergonomics of these knives. And it's just something that's unexpected from the design. So it kind of uh, reinforces that don't judge a book by its cover uh, mm -hmm. kind of concept. Well, and, and oftentimes uh, you can't get both. You can get form, but you can't get the function. But then sometimes you can get the function without the form. So, I mean, right. having all those two things kind of come together is really an unusual feat. It is indeed, especially in such an unusual package. Right. That is going to wrap it up, everybody, for the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. I want to say thanks for listening, and be sure to join us again next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.